Good afternoon. I am Darren Walker. I am an African-American bald man wearing glasses with a navy blazer and a red and blue checked shirt. I'm in my library with books behind me, and I want to welcome you to Ideas at Ford and the occasion of a conversation with a remarkable woman named Julia Swad, who has produced a, a book, uh, a book of another remarkable woman. Her name was Claudia Taylor. Johnson, also known as Lady Bird. And this book, In Plain Sight, is a masterpiece. It is the result of years of meticulous research and a creative writing style that is unique in biography. And so, I wanna welcome you, Julia Swag, and congratulate you. You are officially a New York Times best-selling author. I know that this book has been a labor of love for you. And of course, you know, as a Texan who grew up with all things Lady Bird, she was one of my sheroes. She was the idealized Texas woman. She was the idealized steel magnolia. We talk about where I'm from. Women who are poised and somewhat delicate, but yet they have muscles made of steel and you capture the strength, the character, uh, the uniqueness of this woman we affectionately knew as Lady Bird Johnson. So welcome, Julia. Thank you, Darren. I'm just delighted to be here. And I am Julia Swig. I have brown hair and kind of large roundish tortoise shell glasses and I'm wearing a black blouse. Well, and you also are celebrating. I wanna go back to yes, indeed. where this all started because Lady Bird is written, she, she wrote an autobiography. Um, there's been, there's a narrative. We understood Lady Bird Johnson or at least we thought we did, there was, there was lots of things written about Lady Bird. Why did you feel a need to write this book about Lady Bird? Well, Darren and all of your team, just thanks a million for having me here. It's, it's hugely exciting. And I'm, and I'm so happy to have this conversation with you, especially you, the Texan, you, the Head Start baby, uh, who knew Lady Bird, as you told me, when you were on campus at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, you know, at first, when I decided I need to, needed to pivot away from Latin American history and politics, which was my old profession, I wanted to write about women and power, but I didn't have a subject. And a friend of mine said to me, you know, Lady Bird Johnson kept a diary when she was in the White House. And there began my discovery that in fact, the stories and the mythologies and the received wisdom about Lady Bird were really begging to be debunked. And in fact, her own material about herself, that documentary record that she left allowed me to do that. And by that, I'm talking about thousands of pages of material in the LBJ archives and around the country and other archives but especially the audio diary, the other LBJ tapes, I like to think of them as, that she kept when she was in the White House, 123 hours of material. And she published some of it, not quite an autobiography, but a heavily redacted version in 1970 of those diaries. Mm 
And for some reason, they've sort of been ignored. I think I, ha- I can, I have Let's some talk ideas about, about that. Why. Why, why have they been ignored? Because you know why they've been ignored because she was a woman. Talk about right. that. So, so there's a, I mean, this whole field of presidential history very much focuses on the president who so far in American history has been men, uh, male. And the, that male gaze by the biographer, by the historian of the guy in the White House has distorted the questions that are asked, has distorted the material that is reviewed to tell that story and tell that history. And, you know, Lyndon Johnson of all people, right? He's the American president most associated with power and this kind of domineering charisma and Lady Bird's role partially because of her own acts of representing herself while she was in the White House and partially because nobody could fathom that she was as influential as she was, that kind of gendered historiography is the, of the story just left her aside. So what I tried to do is place her into the center of the LBJ presidency. And of course she left the material that allowed us to do that. I think though, you are onto something here that is much uh, bigger than even just this book. And I do want to talk about that. But there is clearly a history of uh, making somewhat invisible the influence and power of the woman by the side of the president. And of course, we all know Eleanor Roosevelt was powerful. Um, that, that's well documented. She asserted herself. She, in fact, unlike Lady Bird, inserted herself publicly yes. uh, into the business of uh, a policy, whereas Lady Bird had a different tact. And yet she was so influential. She was so uh, impactful in ultimately what turned into policy. As you say, as a Head Start baby, I know there would be no Head Start without, without Lady Bird. I think she had a, partially because she was a white woman of the South and had grown up in Alabama and then later in Texas or back and forth between the two. I think she was also, she was also, as was Lyndon, a a New Deal Democrat with a very progressive idealist view of, of what the role of government and the state should be in leveling the playing field in terms of race and class. But because of that, she had, because she was conscious of the institutional roots of white supremacy, she was careful and tread carefully in showing and shining her light on the spaces in American society that needed elevating. I think she was always very conscious of the potential for backlash. And she also was, um, she wasn't Eleanor Roosevelt. She, she had a different style and LBJ was a different kind of person than, than FDR himself, but she was, I think, maybe cautious to a fault, Darren. You know, she did not toot her own horn publicly. Mm-hmm. She didn't have a regular column or a radio show or anything like that, but she had a very systematic strategy for working with the press, nevertheless, and she put herself out there all time. She was a woman on the hustings and campaigns, but also, and speaking of Head Start, even though she didn't, it wasn't the main focus. I mean, she is very associated with it and she lent her public persona to it. She went to visit Head Start centers all over the country when she traveled, but she felt that it wasn't going to be the her main show. Her main show was actually the environment. But by putting her light onto Head Start, I think what she did was show the country that young children, black and white, and by the way, Latino, there's a whole story about the uh, support for education and health and literacy for uh, border families, especially along the Texas border in the, in the 1960s that I think is totally unknown and totally different than what we've seen over the last few years in terms of border policy. She was clear about all of those things, but she tread cautiously. But she did, I mean, this is the thing that is uh, amazing about uh, both she and her husband. They were the, the, the products of this clearly white supremacist 
uh, culture and society and structures. And in fact, her husband talked about uh, white supremacy when he made that famous statement about as long as you can convince a poor white that uh, there's someone uh, beneath him, uh, you can pick his pockets. And he was saying this about the elite whites in Texas uh, who were pitting blacks and, uh, and working class whites against each other uh, for political gain. Um, a strategy that um, has been successful in, um, in uh, successive years, regrettably. Yeah. But he talked about that. She talked about white supremacy. Um, and they were radicals in some way. I mean, I think the tragedy of Johnson and, and it, it, that, that era is they were, they were social radicals for, for, uh, for their time, for their background, for their... And, and the tragedy, of course, which we'll get to a Vietnam, which, which completely uh, uh, eviscerated uh, their, their reputa his reputation um, and, 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 and erased so much of uh, the good he did um, because of that um, horrible mistake of, of Vietnam. But talk about the sort of things that we, uh, we might not know that you learned about Lady Bird that would surprise us. Um, and, and there's some things I, I know I'd like to bring up, but just I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, and, and, and I agree with you about their radicalism. It's, they're radical for today's Democratic Party. You know, they're, they're very, very surprising in, in, in their radicalism. And, I haven't used the word radical to describe them. I often use the word progressive, but given how much the debate and the country's politics have shifted over the last four decades, five decades, they really were, and it's astonishing. And we'll come back to the, the way Vietnam derailed them and undermined them. A couple of things, um, Lady Bird's power and influence is exhibited, and you see this in the documents, in crafting the entire arc of the Johnson presidency, this is number one, the chronology. We all know that at the end of March, 1968, Lyndon Johnson announced that he would not be running for another term. He stepped out of the 1968 presidential race and it came as a huge surprise. In fact, to almost everybody, almost everybody but Lady Bird, Going back to May of 1964, I found a document. Now they're only five months into the presidency after the Kennedy assassination, which in which Lady Bird lays out this arc. Lyndon is insecure. He doesn't know if he does run in 64, whether he'll be able to win and keep the country united. And he's also seeing that civil rights are stuck in the Congress and pressure to escalate in Vietnam is growing, pressure from the Kennedy War Council that he kept on. So he's tormented and he asks Lady Bird to lay out the pros and cons for him of running or not running. She lays this out in what I've called now the Huntland Strategy Memo. It's a document I found in the library, pretty much ignored by all the historians, which says, look, you're too young to retire now you need to run again and you'll probably win. And when you win, we can then have three years and a few more months to do our best. It won't be easy, but in February or March of 1968, you can tell the world that you won't be running for another term. And that is precisely what he does. And we can see in her documents and her diaries, the way she pushed that strategy forward with him, the way they planned it together. And this joint political enterprise that they were running together in the White House was something that was already well established by the time they came into the White House. But over the course of the presidency, especially after they lose one of their closest advisors, Walter Jenkins, which is an important story. Yes, in we'll book. come back to Walter Jenkins. Okay, she becomes really his, his most trusted, closest advisor. I don't know if she had a security clearance, Darren, but I know that she was in the room and reading documents. And she said as early as 1966 that two thirds of what the two of them talked about was Vietnam. Moreover, on the policy side of the great society, Lady Bird took the environmental portfolio. And that's, I think, a wonderful story about her. And it, it, it goes to this kind of um, 
you know, not only her name Ladybird, but also this signature policy beautification have these kind of benign feminized words to them. In fact, what was beautification? It was a radical environmental vision that tried to bring together, especially in Washington DC, access to nature for the most underserved members of this majority, I'm in Washington now, this majority black city at the time with civil rights and representation. That's what she was about because she believed from in her bones that access to nature for all Americans was what and is what makes us feel whole. And she was horrified in the wake of urban renewal around the country that so many communities of color had seen their communities destroyed without services and fair housing and foods, food and nature and basic community goods put in place. This is the yes. radical part, Julie, that I, that I, because in some ways, Lady Bird was a Trojan horse for, <laughs> she, she, she neutralized with her feminized uh, Southern uh, uh, sort of vernacular style, what was behind her, which was this army of emerging new field of environmental public interest law, so you had, you know, which the Ford Foundation was deeply engaged in, you had all of these lawyers now saying, suing, saying actually public citizens have a right to beauty. They have a right yes. to clean water. They have a right to their air. They have a right to have open space. And Jane Jacobs and all of the things that were emerging, right. she really put um, um, an attractive, um, somewhat palatable face on what was a pretty progressive out there pioneering agenda. It was so attractive and so palatable that it sort of in the blink of an eye went unnoticed. You know, that's why I say she was sort of cautious to a fault. She had Jane Jacobs to the White House, one of her very first doers luncheons to elevate professional women was with of all people, Jane Jacobs. Now, couldn't you imagine, wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall in a oh discussion between the two of them? You and not only, not only environmental uh, activists on the law side, but also black architects and landscape architects. She, she elevated the field of landscape architecture, which in the 1960s was having a huge battle with establishment architects who were taking municipal and federal monies to build these huge tower and park plaza atrocities. The landscape architects were the ones who were making this case about access to green space and the relationship between our soul and the built environment in American cities. And that's who she backed. Well, she was absolutely uh, not uh, a typical woman because the Walter Jenkins story is rife with metaphors and allegory. And it really does demonstrate her power. And most people don't know the Walter Jenkins story. Why don't you share? Okay, I'll do my best. And I will say, I did produce a podcast for ABC News and episode two, if, if I don't do a great job of telling the story, I would suggest people go listen to that. There's one reason why, because we can hear the audio conversation between Lady Bird and Lyndon that I'm about to describe. So if you wanna hear her power and hear her mastery of LBJ and hear, hear her humanity, go listen to that. But I'll tell the story. This was the October surprise of the 1964 election in a way, because Lady Bird and Lyndon were both out campaigning, she in the South on her whistle stop tour, supporting the Civil Rights Act, supporting his election. He was in Iowa, I think. And on October 14th, 1964, her chief of staff and chief press aide, Liz Carpenter, gets a call that Walter Jenkins, who is LBJ and Lady Bird's longest standing aide of the last 30 years, Catholic man, six kids, has been arrested after being discovered in some sort of un illegal at the time homosexual act in a YMCA in Washington, DC. And that arrest is about to go public. And so Liz Carpenter gets a call from a fellow journalist and says, what is this? And suddenly Lady Bird, 
becomes aware from Liz that in the middle, three weeks before the election, there's about to be a sex scandal that's going to potentially taint the election. What does she do? She first develops a strategy that is totally human in its approach, where she doesn't want to throw Walter Jenkins under the bus. She wants to put out a statement recognizing his humanity. And she calls Lyndon Johnson and she says, this is how I want to handle this. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. And he's already gone to his guys, Abe Fortas and, and Clark Clifford. They've called him and they've got a plan to bury the story, um, put Walter Jenkins aside, never discuss it, move the president and the campaign as far away from pos as possible from this, no comment and just basically throw the guy under the bus. Terrible. She says, no. She says, the way we're gonna handle it is with this kind of statement, I'm gonna be asked, you're gonna hear me say, Lyndon, that this is a, a, a man whom we love and who we wanna support. And she brings LBJ around and he winds up after Lady Bird releases her statement, releasing his own that mirrors his. She totally moves him away from this old school approach to burying the story to embracing Walter Jenkins' humanity. And it's a, a, a story that shows, A, that she knows how to move the ball with LBJ laying a strategy out first, but B, that she has enormous sensitivity to, to Walter's humanity. And she um, doesn't do, uh, and Walter Jenkins, unlike many closeted homosexual men whose careers and finances were ruined because Lady Bird had wealth of her own. And in fact, it was her money over the many years that made it possible for him to be in public life and for them to have such a good life. Uh, I believe she then brought Walter Dinkins within the company, uh, the, the LBJ companies that uh, her family, in part she'd inherited from her father, but built into a much bigger enterprise. That's true. So he left Washington DC and she persuaded LBJ and his minions that Walter should be set up with a proper job and, and treated as well as possible. And she stayed in touch as did LBJ with Walter Jenkins and remained friends with the family. But, but you're correct about her financial power within the marriage. She did, just to go back a bit, finance LBJ's first campaign with money she had inherited from her mother. And she also financed the purchase of their first media holding, KTBC, in Austin. She and LBJ, again, part of that, I know we're shifting a little bit, that joint political enterprise, but it was also a joint business enterprise. And, and he's been taken to task for using all kinds of political uh, horse trading in order to get the right kind of blanket FCC license and, and, and the like. The two of them together grew that media company. So again, it was a political enterprise and one with a big economic foundation that she had a huge role in. So let's talk, uh, before we get to Vietnam, I wanna talk about race. Sure. Because uh, the Johnson was very clear that the direction of the, of the country was moving away from him. Um, she was very clear that what they were doing was angering uh, and potentially alienating uh, working class, especially working class whites. And in fact, Johnson famously said that the South was going to be lost and it was just a matter of time. As he was trying to keep things together and we remember the, the famous uh, Atlantic City Democratic Convention and Fannie Lou Hamer and the Dixiecrats and all of that narrative. Um, how do you think they, from the standpoint of race and Lady Bird, took on this issue genuinely, sincerely, but did they really believe in their rhetoric? Did she really believe, do you believe Lady Bird believed in equality? Oh, I think she absolutely did, yes. You know, I think she was torn 
about how quickly she, people in positions of power could move vis-a-vis -vis racial equality in the country. I think she was alert from the very beginning to this potential white backlash. And you know, when she traveled through the South to campaign for the Civil Rights Act, she was attacked verbally and even with death threats. So she was aware, I think, that there would be a backlash, but she was also aware, you know, there's this wonderful scene during, on the weekend of Bloody Sunny, Sunday in Selma in 1965, when she talks about her childhood growing up 25 miles from the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And she talks about the necessity to avoid insanity of getting the second civil rights bill passed, the Voting Rights Act passed. So she was very much within that tension of, of knowing what the right path forward was, but anticipating the backlash. And then Darren, there's another piece to, to her approach or, or, or the way our racial dynamics in this country confounded her and LBJ, which is that when the riots in American cities began, and, and I like to kind of deconstruct that word and think of them more as political uprisings against police brutality, against housing unfairness, against lack of jobs, so similar to our racial reckoning today. When those riots, when those uprisings began and proliferated, she was totally confounded because I think she also underestimated as many liberal reformers did in the 1960s, the depth of the structural roots of supremacist institutions and how incredibly angry and, uh, and needy, needy of, of radical change Americans felt themselves to be. They thought that change through the courts and legislatively over time would in fact level the playing field. Martin Luther King has that speech about, you know, I don't have time. It's the last speech he gave at the National Cathedral before he was assassinated. Don't tell me that I should be patient. I'm paraphrasing really badly here. I think that there was this tension between how much time does the country have to make these reforms take root. And she was taken aback by the urgency that so many felt. And she was taken aback, I think, because like many uh, reformers, progressives even, uh, radicals even, uh, she thought of things through a framing that really was uh, enshrined in so many ways. In fact, we have a there was a board meeting, the Ford Foundation in the 60s, and the theme of the board meeting was the Negro problem in America. Right? And, and, and this was from a progressive, this was from McGeorge Bundy's. Or, I mean, the, the, the challenge is even for a ladybird, even for the most progressive, the idea was we have this problem with Negroes in America. We have this problem in Negro communities. And I think the Carter Commission, which you have studied, the challenge for the Johnsons with the Kerner Commission report was that it put squarely the problem in America as not a Negro problem, right. but actually a problem of white people in America. Correct, correct. And, and that is why the Kerner Commission was basically buried I mean, that is why the report was never uh, fully embraced uh, by the president who had, um, had orchestrated it with, an, with, right. with the promise that it would be uh, a path forward. And in fact, what the commissioners said was that the problem we have in this country is what you just described, institutional racism and white supremacy and white supremacist ideas imbued into the structures of our very democracy. And that was just too much for them. I mean, that, that, that the problem can't be with white people. I mean, the problem <laughs> with these 
these burning cities is, is with Negroes who are burning them down. And I think that was the hardest thing for people like Lady Bird and Lyndon to really embrace, particularly because they so genuinely were committed and they had so genuinely taken the heat um, for, for being truly um, yes. sincere about racial equality. I, I couldn't say it better. I mean, the story of the Kerner Commission is wild because it, I recommend everybody just go and read it because it is it is a radical document. I believe almost every member of the Kerner Commission was white. There was one woman on it, Katie Pettin, and the language and the uh, edginess of it is is astonishing. And so Lyndon, who by February of 1968, when it came out, you know, it's just this man had had enough. He couldn't, he, there was no way he could turn where he could get anyone to cut him any slack. And he felt really, well, he was exhausted. That's why he got out and, and he knew he wasn't going to be able to, but it wasn't just that it was buried. You know, he had all kinds of concocted ideas about conspiracies and he kind of got into that Nixonian paranoid attack the media mode and Lady Bird herself, probably in her post-presidency, I would guess, there were some seminars at the LBJ library about the Kerner commission that she encouraged, but at the time they couldn't digest yeah. it. Well, before going to Q and A, I will tell you that my, you referenced that I was lucky enough to know Mrs. Johnson and, yes. and uh, Lucy and Linda as well, who, by the way, I saw when you said Selma, I was uh, lucky enough to be in Selma uh, on um, the 50th anniversary with John Lewis. It was an amazing occasion. But who I am walking and on the bridge and behind oh. me, I hear someone say in a lovely Southern uh, voice, Darren. And I turn around and it was Lucy Burke, who, uh, of course, I know from from Austin and Linda. She was with Linda, Rob. And we just it was such a wonderful uh, meeting. And we talked about Head Start and her mother because they knew but I was lucky enough because I received some award when I was in, in, in college that the, the big payoff was that I got to have uh, lunch with Lady Bird once a year at the faculty center. And it was Well, tell us amazing. about that. No, no, I, I wouldn't get, but no, it was, it was, it was, she would say, you know, the thing that she said when we first met was, I wish Lyndon were alive because this is what he hoped for. And, and when I told her about, you know, I was in the first class of Head Start and, and my background and that I was at UT on scholarship and uh, a Pell Grant, which they had also, as you know, uh, been, been supportive of, um, she was, she, and she was just very proud. And whenever I see Lucy or Linda, they always, they remember that I was a Head Start kid and they always say, you know, mom was so proud. I had dinner with, um, I was down and gave a talk at the LBJ school last, actually in February of 2020. Um, and I had dinner with, um, with Lucy and we talked about this and her mom and you no, know, that's just amazing. Anyway, it's time for Q and A because okay. I know we've got lots of questions for you and my esteemed and inimitable colleague, Sierra, manages the Q&A part of the talk. Well, thank you so much, Darren. And thank you, Julia, for that conversation. We have a ton of questions here. Uh, so I'll start at the top. Um, somebody said, we love this conversation and I'm moved by Lady Bird's belief in access to nature, access to beauty as a necessity to making us feel whole. How can we embed this into public policies such as the new infrastructure bill? Why are these necessities still treated politically only as afterthoughts or nice to haves? Uh, well, let me, let, as Bill Clinton would say, let me take the second question first. Um, I, I think we still have um, a long way to go in integrating that essential understanding of human needs, frankly, that access to nature is essential to us feeling whole. 
I don't know why it's so complicated, right? It should be pretty straightforward. But what, now that we have a, 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 an enormous amount of public spending about to happen, I think now is the time to try to make sure as infrastructure is built, we go back to the moment when Lady Bird was receiving and perhaps Jill Biden will be in a position to do this or somebody in the White House, communities need to become very active right now in registering what their criteria are for this huge explosion in infrastructure construction, if that's what we're gonna see. I mean, what happened after the 1950 highway uh, interstate highway system bills were passed and all of this money was flushed into the system was that there was no regulation and no community, not initially, very little community input. So I think this is the time, and, and Lady Bird was actually sensitive to this. You know, part of her environmentalism was going around to small communities and towns and saying, you must make your voices heard so that the people in Washington do the right thing. And I think that's exactly where we need to be again in communities expressing what they want and what they don't want, want with the spending of these federal dollars. Thank you. So there's a, a couple of questions here about Robert Caro and his research on the LBJ presidency. Um, and, and people are struck by what a terrific writer Lady Bird was and that she really hasn't been mentioned in some of these other volumes. Uh, why do you think that is that, you know, Robert Caro and others have not really addressed the importance and impact of Lady Bird? I'm glad to have these questions. And I would say there's a couple answers. Number one, uh, Caro, I would place into that context of a historian or journalist who is very focused on the protagonist male in the Oval Office. And importantly, because that individual, and Caro does write about this, because LBJ did have this pro proclivity toward vulgarity and also infidelity, those two aspects of his personality, I think, wound up allowing people like Caro to treat, to paint Lady Bird as LBJ's victim, to deprive her of agency within that joint enterprise that was their marriage and was their professional career together. Um, the second thing to be very clear is that Caro's volumes stop in July of 1964. He has not yet completed his latest book on the entire presidency. I have to assume that the diaries that Lady Bird kept during the White House will become part of his narrative. I hope they do. But those diaries had been largely open for some time, not fully unredacted. Um, and, you know, I think there's a kind of gendered practice in history writing that we've talked about. Um, also, LBJ himself is a huge figure in American history. And so just getting one's arms around the story of LBJ's political career is a Herculean task. When you bring in that jointness when you bring in another central character into the story, I mean, it would take two lifetimes to do justice to the Johnson presidency if Lady Bird were centered the way I've tried to for his entire career. But you've made it impossible for Caro's final volume to be written in a way in which Lady Bird is a victim. And I think- Thank you, I hope so. And I think, this is uh, 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 endemic uh, of the kind of writing that comes from male uh, journalists and male historians and biographers who can only see through the lens of their own gender what power actually looks like. And as you say, the fact that he was a philanderer did not make her a powerless wallflower uh, in their relationship. And many women have knowingly understood 
their husbands philandering and still been able to establish and sustain powerful partnership with them for significant impact on the world for good. And obviously she was, as you document, she was very well aware of her husband's philandering. Um, she did not excuse it, um, but she was not paralyzed by it. No, Darren, she wasn't paralyzed by it. And also, you know, she was, Lyndon was a very complex person emotionally and psychologically. And he, because he relied on her so totally by the time they got into the White House, she derived enormous power from that position. So in a, in a multiple decade layered marriage that they had, you know, I, I, I'm not at all excusing it. I'm simply saying that her substance and her agency and the power she exercised over him had to, at a certain point, compensate or at least somewhat neutralize the sting of that element. And that's what we don't see in Caro yet. And we don't see it yet. And we may not see it, it in anyone. Again. It's we not, don't. Not just, we don't. It's not until your book, we have not, and we've not seen it in her writing. I mean, I mean, you know, she has been, she was never fully willing to publicly acknowledge and own her power, like lots of women of, of uh, years past. But I do think that your book will be a marker on how the Johnsons are, are written about the treatment of them uh, in history in the future. Sarah. Thank you. So um, many people are curious about Lady Bird's background. Uh, they want to know where the nickname came from, but also where did her sense of social justice and racial justice come from? Um, they're also curious about her political profile after leaving the White House and after um, Lyndon's death. I, you know, I'm not sure that I can completely pin her sense of social and racial justice on one particular incident. She was raised by descendants of enslaved people. That's who gave her her nickname Ladybird, which stuck. She was orphaned, not orphaned, I, I mis misspoke. She, was, she lost her mother when she was five years old. She was raised in part by her caregivers and also by an aunt from Alabama and her straight out of a Tennessee Williams play father. Um, you know, LBJ's own sensibilities around race and class really influenced hers. You know, they came from different social strata. But when he was in his 20s, he was teaching young Mexican children on the border. You know, my husband's a fifth grade teacher, and he always says to me, you know, anybody who in their 20s is out there teaching kids on the border has to have a sensibility around race and class. So if you think about LBJ's own origin story in terms of him becoming who he was by the time he was in the White House, that's very, very important. And it really did af affect uh, Lady Bird. But, you know, there's plenty of progressive white Southerners who early in the 20th century had strong activism around leveling the racial playing field. And that's where she came from too. As far as her post-presidency, you know, um, the Johnsons didn't have anything that we would recognize as a work-life balance. And they would have laughed if they had heard that expression. They were constantly mixing the two together. So, and Lyndon Johnson died in 1973. He died on the day that the Roe versus Wade uh, decision was issued by the Supreme Court. And actually there's a little story about their support for Planned Parenthood and universal access to birth control in the book as well. So she had more than 30 years after he died of her post-presidency and she spent it with her kids and her grandkids traveling around the world. But she also had a couple of institutions that she cared a lot about. One was UT, she was on the, the board of governors there. 
She was also on the board of the National Geographic Society. She kept a hand in the family business. She built which is a, what is today a fantastic environmental education institution, which is called the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, but has a big environmental component to it. And she was uh, incredibly important in the institution of the LBJ library. Hers was the decision to release LBJ's tape, tapes in 1995. Hers was the decision to err toward transparency as much as possible in the uh, material and access to historians and researchers at that library. So she continued her journalism, history, environment, priorities, even bringing access to nature in Austin, Texas. The uh, town lake now called Lady Bird Lake and all of those beautiful trails in Austin, that's something that she campaigned for and helped raise money for uh, once she was back there, which is kind of the culmination of what she had hoped to bring to Washington, DC. Thank you so much. And, and I'll make this uh, my last question. Um, everyone is just really thanking you for this work and complimenting you on how well researched it is. Uh, a couple of folks want to know if there are any surprising revelations that are not included in the book that you want to share. Oh, surprising revolution revelations not well the first version of this book was 800 pages long and I had to cut it by 300 pages. So I will tell you that there's um there's a moment in the book we cut an entire chapter in which right after the Martin Luther King assassination, Lady Bird Johnson still rather bizarrely to my mind leaves Washington DC and she takes a group of 30 European journalists to Texas to inaugurate what was called Hemisphere, which was sort of a Texan version of the World's Fair. And it was designed to show Texas's cosmopolitan side and also Texas as an anchor within the Americas. So she went to Hemisphere, it was in San Antonio, Texas, and Hemisphere was built, this isn't a revelation, it's just a story that I'm sad isn't in the book, on land in San Antonio that had been raised for urban renewal. And so there's a kind of incredible irony to me that this place she went to inaugurate and sprinkle her fairy dust on was born out of precisely the kind of public policy that she was trying to redress in other American cities. But those are the contradictions of, of all of us, right? Nothing is ever pure or clean. There's especially people in power are dealing with adjacencies and complexities all the time and they're often contradictory. Well, Julia, you were able to capture the complexity of this really inimitable first lady, uh, a woman who was committed to social justice, woman committed to racial equality, but who in her own life was challenged by her background, her social class, her status, the expectations of others of a woman Mm -hmm. of her background and social class, inheriting uh, the tort of Jacqueline Kennedy and carrying forward with dignity and grace um, and with boldness. All of these uh, things you capture so well in this remarkable book, In Plain Sight. I commend this book to you if you do not have it order many, many copies so that Julia can remain on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, I think uh, this book is a love letter, not only a love letter, Julia, to, uh, to Lady Bird, but a love letter to America of uh, dreams and what is possible uh, when you have women uh, like Lady Bird Johnson uh, in charge. So, um, let us hope that in the future, uh, there will be uh, a woman in charge, truly in charge uh, and able um, through her own power alone to advance uh, policy and social change and social justice. That will change how history is written, won't it? It will indeed, but you have changed how history is written Thank with you, this Darren. book. It is uh, a marvel. And uh, you 
uh, Julia are a gift. Thank you oh, so Darren, much. Oh, Darren, thank for you this. so much. Likewise, it's, it's I feel been the a same. treat for us. And I uh, thank all of our guests for this uh, session of Ideas at Ford. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.